Hi, and welcome back to the Cheeky Crypto Podcast. My name's Chris, and it's fantastic to have you back with us for another video. And in today's podcast, we are joined by Sam, the CEO of Findora. We're going to dig into everything that's happening in regards to Findora. If you enjoy this sort of content and you wish to support the channel, mash up that like button, subscribe if you haven't subscribed already, tapping that bell, selecting all the notifications, so you never miss a video. Don't forget to jump in the Discord. Over six and a half thousand people supporting one another. Navigate this space safely. It's the place to immerse yourself. A great community. Uh, so definitely check it out. And best of all, it's absolutely free to join. Link in the description. Right. Let's get down to the interview. So Sam, yeah. um, great to have you on the on the channel. Really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to to join us today. Um, I think it'd be great if we could just open with uh, a bit a bit about yourself. How you got into crypto, uh, how you got involved in Findora. I think it'd be great for the community just to get a bit of understanding, a little bit about you to, to start off with on this podcast. Sure. sure. But hang on, Chris. You know, of course, at the beginning of every interview, I have to thank you for letting me come <laughs> on and talk about my stuff. I have to say it's quite an honor to be here. Uh, let's see what. And then, of course, is the requisite question. How did I fall down the rabbit hole? Uh, so my experience in crypto has been terrific. Uh, you know, I started uh, about five years ago, actually, in crypto itself. But before that, I was working at a company called Knock Knock Labs. Uh, now, the thing that's interesting about Knock Knock Labs is it was populated almost entirely with alumni from PGP, Pretty Good Privacy, which is where Hal, fin Hal Finley worked, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and so for those of us who are, are, are deep into the lore of Bitcoin and Satoshi, he's one of the leading contenders for being Satoshi. Um, but... Knock Knock, based on a lot of work that, that PGP did, uh, their technology was based in public and private key encryption pairs. And so that was my opening into the whole blockchain space. So um, I participated in my first ICO, which at the time was totally okay. Um, <laughs> things may have changed, uh, but it, that was for Civic that had to do, at the time, it was really focused on a more of a decentralized identity uh, conception. And uh, from Civic, then I also found out about uh, Tezos, which I also participated in. And then I got very involved in the Tezos community, which was really exciting. Um, so my first real job when I left Knock Knock was actually to get the Tezos Commons st stood up and operational, which was their marketing and communication and community arm at the very, very early days of Tezos. Very, very early. In fact, I was in Paris working like a crazy man. Um, when the Tezos beta net and mainnet launched um, with the Tezos team. It was a really, really exciting time, really, really busy. Um, and then I just continued to, to follow that path. You know, I started with Tezos, which was, I was very interested in the technology. Uh, but then as I realized, just like almost any other ecosystem, you kind of need to have a population. You kind of need to have some energy existing to really make it flourish. At Tezos, we ran into a huge problem of, no one knew the, the, the smart contract language. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, maybe I need to go somewhere else. Maybe I need to take a look at this Ethereum thing that people keep on talking about. Um, so that's when I got involved in the Ethereum ecosystem and went to Thundercore and then, you know, spent some time um, with a great group there. And eventually I ended up at Harmony, which was exciting. And we did a lot of really amazing things at Harmony. Um, and then this last year I moved over to Fendora because... The path that I've been charting has been really about adoption. That's why I went from Tezos to Thundercore is, is that project was really about driving adoption. Uh, Harmony was really about getting crypto into the hands of the next billion users. They said 10 billion, but we only have, what, 8 billion people right now? So <laughs> their estimate's a little off. Um, and, then, uh, uh, and then coming over to Fendora about the fact that the usability, the adoption, and the individual privacy that, that the Fendora blockchain can provide kind of wraps all of my missions all in one go. So it's been very exciting. There you go. Was that a good rabbit hole question? I feel like maybe I wandered a little bit there, but hopefully Perfect. it turned out okay. Perfect. Uh, Absolutely I, spot on. <laughs> I think it was really good, obviously, to get a history of who you are. Because, you know, the community, the, the listeners like to know this kind of thing. So leading on from that, can you maybe tell us a bit more about Fendora? How it works obviously we have got a big following here uh, in cheeky crypto of Fendora, so you know i'm sure yeah. everybody would like to know 
I appreciate that. And to be honest, and I'm not quite sure, what do we call Fendorans now? Are they Fendorians? Are they Finns? Like, what, what is the expression that we... I think, like, it's, that, fin, I think it's Fendorians, but uh, Finn sounds better, I think. Finn, Finn's <laughs> works very well for this channel when we talk yeah. about the whale wallets. So I, I like Finn. There you Finn's go. Good. <laughs> Let's yeah. call them Finns. Let's do it. <laughs> um, so the thing I like about Fendora, so I joined Fendora shortly after, well, about six, nine months after they launched their EVM chain. Um, so it was designed originally as a UTXO chain written in Rust that has a several different features um, that standard Ethereum virtual machine compatible chains do not have. And that's one of the reasons why I was very interested is because this dual chain architecture allows us to do certain things on Fendora that you can't do on other EVM chains. And that's how we run our, our ZK proofs, our ZK snarks and our bullet proofs. That's also how we're running um, our privacy through the UTXO layer. Um, but it's all built in under the hood. So the user doesn't have to experience too much of that. They can just experience their wallet interface. Um, so I, the core question was, what is important about Fendora, I guess, if I remember, Jamie? Yeah, just basically what Fendora is and how it works. Yeah. Um, so it's EVM compatible. So it's a proof of stake uh, um, network and it runs the Tendermint um, consensus mechanism, which is slightly different than your Byzantium fault tolerant or your hot stuff. You know, there's there a lot of various different, very, very similar, but there's one or two details that are different between those consensus mechanisms. Um, and it's the thing that I find interesting about it, especially right now, is that Fendora is very, very young. Like we barely have, I wish I could be, you know, more upbeat about the status of our, our ecosystem, but we barely have anything going on right now, which means that now is a fantastic time to build because we have the EVM compatibility. We've got the infrastructure coming together. And so now I'm basically at the beginning of building the pyramids, which is really cool. So over the course of the next six months, year, two years, the stuff at Fendora is going to really explode, really emphasizing how we can learn to expect privacy from our suppliers where we can really actually have privacy in our dealings. So, yeah, and I think, the, uh, yeah, I was going to say, I, I think the, the, the privacy, as, uh, privacy aspect of things is, is really important. Um, you know, being able to have more control and, and that side of things. Could we just dig into that in a bit more detail? Like what are sure. the, the, the use cases and um, the benefits of that? I think. Yeah, that's a good question. So when we think about the way I think about blockchain ecosystems, I usually group them into four verticals. So I have my DeFi, which is the most common, NFTs, which everyone is loving right now. We also have games, which are very much emerging, and DAOs. Now, DAOs had a huge shine on them last year. Everyone was really excited about them. Then we realized that maybe our technology and honestly, the, the training of the individuals, the, 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 you know, the flesh part of the DAO, needs a little bit of work. Um, but those are my my four main verticals that I think about. So talking about how privacy can affect each of those four verticals, the DeFi one is pretty straightforward, right? Because we've had a lot of experience having a pseudo anonymous ledger that anyone can look at and anyone can see. But we also have a lot of experience with a private kind of, you know, interface that I use, for example, at, at Standard Chartered or at Chase or at any of bank of my choice. And what happens is that I'll open up my Chase bank and I can see my wallet, my account with all of my money and all my transactions in there. But Chris, I can't see yours. Mm. And, and that's actually a good thing. Yeah. Um, that being said, right now, I could see your, if I knew your, if I sent you one transaction, I could be able to find your wallet and then break down all the various different transactions that you've received and gone out. And I would know your financial history, your financial life, which, I mean, maybe you're okay with that, but at the end of the day, that's your decision. That's not my decision to create this relationship with you that you don't want, right? Yeah, exactly. And so that is a really important thing about privacy and DeFi. Privacy and NFTs is slightly different, but if you think about it, as we start down the NFT path, we started with copyrights of images, right? So these are your board apes. At its core, NFTs really are liquid intellectual property. And by that, I mean that I can buy, sell, and trade within 24 hours a license to a piece of art, 
or maybe even to a patent, or maybe even to a revenue stream of some sort. When we actually get institutional involvement in NFTs, in this buying, selling, and leasing of intellectual property, those institutions will want and will need these purchases and these licenses to be confidential. And so you're going to need to have privacy in the NFT layer to be able to provide these certain, you know, these, these services to those institutions. Now, granted, that's still two, three, five years out, but it's really important for us to think about that from the architectural level of what the blockchain does. So that's how it applies to NFTs. With, with games, for me personally, I think it's about surprise. Like, I don't want to be able to go and find a smart contract and figure out, oh, this is what's going to be in my loot box when I open it up. You know, this is, I want to be able to be completely surprised. And so again, being able to mask or cover the features of what's actually happening in the game, I think is incredibly valuable. And finally with DAOs, to be honest, this is another huge, massive use case, which is private payroll. Mm, DAOs yeah. run entirely on, on, well, most of them run entirely on crypto networks. Mm. And so being able to do your payroll out to your DAOs, everybody will see what everybody else is making, which on one hand is okay. But the thing is, is you need to have the choice, mm. right? The DAO and the individuals in the DAO need to be able to decide, are they going to do their payroll in public or are they going to do it in private? Um, and that's what we, we provide. It's not forcing you to be private. It's the fact that we give these organizations the, the opportunity to have privacy. Yeah, and that's a very powerful uh, element to to blockchain. I, I feel. I think. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. Something that needs to be tapped into for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. The freedom of choice there, I think, is key. It's it's good. So we'll move on a little bit here. Um, we'll maybe talk about Fendora's history. Maybe over the past twelve months as a project. You know, what's possibly the biggest achievement there? And then for you personally, obviously, you've only been there for nine months. So yourself over nine months, Fendora over the last 12 months, the biggest achievements? Biggest achievements. So uh, I'm sad that you limited it to 12 months because it's like 14 months back is when we launched our EVM staking, like our EVM, uh, not staking, but EVM compatible chain. Um, and that is a huge accomplishment. And so everything since that time has really all been about um, bringing all of the infrastructure online so that people can actually build and interact and and develop projects on Fendora. So after the EVM compatibility came online, we've also had um, the band protocol, which is pretty recent, which is a, an Oracle, which is great. We integrated uh, a graph index, which is also fantastic. We have a multi-sig wallet, which is another vital key component. Um, and we're building out all of these SDKs and we're building out all of this uh, infrastructure, fundamentally. I was trying to find a, a better word for infrastructure, but infrastructure is not super sexy, but it's required. So <laughs> this may not be a very sexy year for Fendora, uh, but it is an incredibly valuable year. Now, one of the other things that we did do um, tail end of the year last year was we did some restaffing and that's when I came on, right? Um, and that is actually really, really important because it it signaled a change between being focused on a build and ship organization and community to a, hey, let's let's take this to the next level. The technology is there, the infrastructure is there. Now it's time to, to uh, you know, blow the doors off of it when it comes to bringing in new open source developers to build new products that launch on our open platform. Yeah, and I, I think on that note, just a segue from, from the set questions, galvanize <laughs> that's okay um, we'll edit it in post <laughs> yeah 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 exactly <laughs> um, yeah to, to galvanize that and, and and get that one over the line how, how do you plan to do that that's a good question because it requires this is the retail politics side of blockchain hmm. um we have to be out there talking to engaging in and competing with the other projects in the EVM space. We don't have the sort of money that some of these other projects have. We don't have the sort of money that Polygon has. We don't have, you know, the the like Avalanche and I mean Solana, but Solana is having their issues. Um, but the point is, is, is when we go out there, we have to have presence at hackathons. And so for example, we're gonna be at ETH Denver here in what, two weeks, three weeks, um, as this is being recorded. That may be, ETH Denver may be way in the past by the time this is actually launched. Um, but uh, uh, but also ETH Denver, then we have ETH Global hackathons. We have hackathons that we're doing with uh, Encode Club, possibly uh, Dora Hacks. 
possibly even, you know, we're, we're talking to, to Gitcoin to possibly do just some smaller individual hacks. But that's really what it is. We publish, we talk about, we provide good bounties and good incentives for hackers and open source developers to come and explore what we do. Uh, fortunately, as far as all the technical components of Findora, we're right there with the rest of them um, as far as our transaction speed, block finality, and, and, and block size and all those details. And then we're able to add on top of that the privacy features as well. Uh, so it gives us a little bit of an edge over some of the others. Yeah, and I think uh, what I've seen from from uh, sort of monitoring the the, the development of the project uh, it is super early, and we've been communicating that with our with our community because that's really important. But obviously, you know, with that comes you know potentially uh, good returns. In my opinion, you know, getting in early at the ground level is is always something that is is you know uh, beneficial when when making investments. But um, We've seen a lot of growth with community is, is one of the things that was a big standout for for me. So it seems like everything's going in the right direction from mm -hmm. from an adoption uh, and community sort of uh, side of things. Um, but what's on the, the roadmap um, moving forward? Because I think that's, again, something that a lot of people should uh, be monitoring, looking at and um, you know be excited about, right? Uh, no, the roadmap is, is exciting. Um, the thing about the roadmap, so as we're recording, we're about halfway through Q1. And the thing I like about where we are in our roadmap right now is out of, let's see, six, nine, ten-ish um, items for Q1, more than half of those are completed. Mm -hmm. And that makes me happy because it, it shows that we're shipping. It shows that we're hitting our, our milestones. It shows that the stuff that we're projecting is actually has some sort of concrete evidence that it's going to happen. Um, and this is what I like about our roadmap is it's very, very heavy, heavily weighted towards the near future. And it's very, very light on what's happening in kind of Q3 and Q4 of this year. And that's specifically the reason why. We don't want to announce and project something so far out that we it'd totally slip. So a couple of the things that I'm very excited. The number one thing I'm the most excited about is something called triple masking. That's the term we're using internally. It's we need to brand that and make it cooler, like, you know, privacy mask, the cowl of Batman sort of a thing. Um, <laughs> but that's a horrible name. Don't call it that. <laughs> um, but the um, the takeaway is this is going to allow us to have with triple masking and then with a view key and auditability, that's the complete tool set. So it's going to allow us to mask uh, wallet addresses, both to and from the asset type. Um, and the asset amount, right? So all of those are now uh, masked. And then when the view key releases, that'll allow us to say, okay, let's send this confidential ledger to my accountant to make sure I'm compliant. Or let's say I get audited by the IRS, or let's say the SEC comes after me for something. I don't know why they would, um, but like I don't do anything that they would be concerned about. Um, but the idea here is, is finally we can do auditing of a private and confidential ledger. And that is something that will be finished here in 2023, which I really see as being, I want my, my marketing voice wants me to say a paradigm shift, but I feel like that's overused. It, it's a big deal. Like this is a big deal. And I'm very excited to see it. So you obviously have spoke there about what's gonna excite you with this roadmap. but is there anything else you maybe want to plug? You know, any other cool things going on with Fendora? <laughs> Yeah, uh, as far as plug, so we're launching our pri our own podcast. So all of your listeners and all of your viewers, you guys can stop listening to Cheeky Crypto and come join <laughs> us at Proof of Privacy. No, I'm kidding. That's This is the brilliance about podcasts and YouTube channels is the fact that it's not a zero-sum game. It's the thing that I actually loved about talking about DAOs over a year ago is the effort was to create a positive-sum environment through cooperation. And that's what podcasting and YouTubing is really all about is I can hop on yours and talk about the Proof of Privacy podcast, which is going to be me interviewing a whole bunch of other you know, thought leaders and executives in the space and talking about honestly what privacy is and what it means to individuals, because it's a very complicated topic um, that on, the, the definition is going to swing wildly between person to person. So I've had some really good conversations. I've banked something on the order of eight to 10. So I have a good two months worth of material so far. Um, so that's very exciting. I cannot wait to see the proof of privacy. So watch, watch the 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 Spotify, the YouTube channels, the Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Patreon. 
where do you guys launch your podcast? Anywhere uh, that you can find cheap, cheeky crypto. Yeah, basically, we're on pretty much all of the the major platforms. I don't think there is one that we're not on, to be fair, when it comes to, to the podcast. But you make a very good point about collaboration and stuff like that. You know, even the terminology in the back end of YouTube, uh, you know, calls other YouTube channels competition. Compet yeah, but it's yeah, not. It's yeah. not. No, it really isn't. Yeah, um, yeah it's uh, a very good point. <laughs> yeah, and the number of times, like one of my favorite podcasts is called Ologies, right? Which is uh, a fantastic science uh, podcast by this woman named uh, Allie Ward. And I discovered it because I was listening to ID10T, which is a comedy podcast with Chris Hardwick. Mm -hmm. And she was interviewed there. And that's how I discover half my podcasts is listening to Joe Rogan. And he has an interesting guest that I totally disagree with, but it's very entertaining. And so yeah. I'm going to go find like that podcast. And that's how, and the same thing with YouTube channels. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. It, it surprises me the terminology in the back end of YouTube. Uh, it, yeah. Shocking. <laughs> it's shocking because that's how they look at it. Right. Mm. And this is one of the big differences that I love about the crypto and the web three. Are we still allowed to call it web three? The crypto and the web three and the, the blockchain community is that number one, the community comes first. You can't have a blockchain project without a community. It is built. Literally, the validator, staker, mm -hmm. mining like network is built on the community. But number two, it's not a famine mentality. It's not the idea that for me to get a listener, you have to not have a listener, right? And that's the beauty and power of podcasting is it's not a zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. And I love that. But the traditional industries they 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 look at it as a zero sum game I, I guess we touched on on uh privacy uh what is expect privacy um expect privacy is the hashtag that we're doing because just like the community in blockchain has given us this idea that we can have a positive sum economic interaction we need to change the mindset across the world which i'm for those of you listening i just kind of had a sigh slash eye roll because this is incredibly difficult. So I want more and more people to hashtag expect privacy because the only way that we're going to get privacy back in our hands, the actual control of our information flow, the actual control of what relationships we decide to create is by expecting privacy from our service providers and from our products. Right now, basically since what, 2000? Almost every single product that has come out has in one way or the other decided it wanted to hoover up and suck up information of yours and then create a relationship on your behalf with an advertiser of some sort or another organization without actually asking you, right? Without caring if you want to have a relationship with, with Squarespace or not. I'm sorry. I know podcasts love Squarespace. I love them too. <laughs> um, but the point is, is the ability to control what information you share is how you define relationships with other people. And th these relationships and this information, that's data. And so we really need the individuals, individual people who are consuming these services and these products to say, no, this is my data. I'm going to expect privacy from the very beginning. And I get to decide who you share it with. There are so many benefits that come out of that change of a mindset um, that I could go into very long details, but I, I don't want to, you know, bore you guys to tears, but it is so important. So that's why we keep talking about expect privacy. Yeah. And I think uh, it's becoming more of a talking point as well. And, uh, you know, with the open AI side of things, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's, you know, crawling the internet and again, gathering all the information that people are putting out there. And um, yeah, maybe, uh we we see the privacy become sort of the next uh, AI kind of narrative that's going around at the moment. Well, so this is this is the thing that I think is important to remember. So I could go down a lot of facts about how to scare you about how your privacy is completely invaded. Um, I could quote, you know, ex CIA directors that say, "Hey, we killed people based on their metadata." That's that's a real quote, by the way. That's not made up. <laughs> um, <laughs> But the point behind all of it is I don't want to be here and say, hey, the sky is falling, the apocalypse is tomorrow. The fact of the matter is, yes, it is. The sky is falling, the apocalypse is tomorrow, but it's always been that way. The apocalypse has always been tomorrow. 
And somehow we as humanity have been able to build tools and figure out and, and outthink our way past an apocalypse or past the end of our world, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where we sit right now. We're finally at the opportunity where privacy and the invasions of privacy and losing that expectation of privacy has gotten to the stage that the apocalypse is tomorrow. But guess what? We have the technology. We have the science. We have the technology. Mm -hmm. We can rebuild them. We can actually fix that now that we have this tech. We can postpone that apocalypse. As Idris Ilba said, we can cancel the apocalypse. That's a quote from Pacific Rim, which is a which is a you know Oscar winning movie that you all should go out and see. It's amazing. Kaiju's robots fighting in the Pacific. Anyway, oh, that's but good. that's that's my goal. Is is it's a positive message. We have the technology. Now all we need is the individuals to actually expect it. That makes so sense. On the I, basis of, uh, you know, expect privacy, you've kind of said how you need everybody to work together here to have it to work properly. So, you know, just to help me out a little bit here, once this starts happening, what happens next with expect privacy? Well, as everyone starts to expect privacy, what we realize is that it's a question of um, individual responsibility. And that's the reason why we gave up our privacy in the first place was because of convenience, right? So we are going to have to realize and be incentivized. And this is where blockchain is so incredibly valuable to say, I want to control the fact that my name, my age, and my gender and my location, I can sell those out to advertisers at, let's say, a dollar a pop, right? But then let's say my, you know, my library of books and Audible, I'll sell those that bit of information for $5. So I can start to segment the data that I have based on its value to me and the value to the advertisers. And now what comes back is the fact that, okay, what about Google and, and Meta? Are they going to go bankrupt? No, because they can still take 80, 90% of the fee in the brokerage between me and the advertisers. It's just I, number one, and this is the important point, have control over my data. And number two, I get paid for it. There is an exchange. There's a medium of exchange that happens. And so as we start to expect privacy, blockchain technology is going to start inserting itself into the various different products and services that we use totally behind the scenes. We're not even going to know what's happening. But that technology is the fundamental to be able to give you, me, all of your listeners, the actual control over our data, our digital assets because we own them and we should own them. And that's what'll happen. Now we'll have a variety of different people, some people who just set it out default, right? And, and for convenience purposes, they don't really care, but you're gonna have other people who want to go into a granular level of how they're selling and how they're licensing out their digital assets and their digital data. Um, and that's excellent. That's what I wanna see. I wanna see us all walking around. We walk around with more computing power in our pocket than it took us to get to the moon in the first place. We can easily manage our, our data trails and our data and our digital assets with that same platform. So that's kind of where I see it going. I think one thing that I would encourage viewers to, to do is go look at like how much value worth of data like you're giving away right like yeah. i mean it's monstrously high uh for for certain individuals so yeah i think uh there's there's huge value there and uh awareness is probably the the, the biggest uh thing to to sort of uh, or hurdle to to overcome i feel yeah. um i think there's a there's a really interesting narrative that could eventually come out which is why would we need something like universal basic income when we can monetize our personal data that can create a universal income stream without having to rely on charity or wealth redistribution or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm just walking around with my phone doing the same thing I do every day anyway, but now I'm suddenly making, you know, $50 a day or $150 a day or, or however much it is because advertisers are paying me for that data. I see this as a win-win, as long as I'm in control, right? I need to be the one that's in control of my data. So I think it's a very, very powerful, very powerful evolution. Not saying we're going to win that fight, by the way. <laughs> that could still be very much pie in the sky. That could still be very much, you know, a utopian dream. Uh, but it's one that I'm willing to fight for. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I think it's a, 
a valid cause to 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 try to conquer right um can you talk us through uh the grant program uh i think there'll be a sure. lot of people in our community that would be interested in that for sure yeah so um the first thing i have to make sure that i flag because i've run into this a couple of different times before running grab programs is a grant program is not mean that we are a venture capital firm we are not a piggy bank we are not the the payroll department for somebody's startup we are, this a grant is to help um take the edge the rough edge off of deploying a new product right um it takes it lowers your risk assessment just a little bit um because you have a little bit of known in that sea of unknown that startups usually run into uh, so we're focused on, of course, you know, three of those four verticals that we heard before, you know, DeFi, NFTs, and um, not DAOs, gaming, sorry, brain fart. Um, <laughs> but yeah, DeFi, NFTs, and, and gaming. And what we do, what we've decided to do with the Fendora grant program is there's a rolling acceptance, right? So people right now, applications are available um fendora.com uh, slash grants and then what that does is it comes into our team and we review it on a weekly basis uh you know a couple of my team members we go through the initial review and then we push it over to kind of the technical and business uh review and that happens the next day and then if they're technical or business deep dive questions that happens you know the third day which is usually thursday and then we respond to everybody on on fridays that does not mean if you get a response from us, that doesn't mean that you're going to get a grant. It just means that we are looking deeper into what happens. So usually we'll communicate with all the grantee uh, applicants every week. And once a quarter, this one's going to be in March, we'll announce the people who received the grants. Uh, we've the Fedora Foundation, which is different than Discrete Labs, but Fedora Foundation has dedicated $100 million to this particular grant program. That's not all going to go out the door this year, right? We're going to be very select. We're going to be very careful about making sure that those assets are deployed in the best way possible. I view that $100 million fund as the energy that we have to put into the system to create the flywheel that will perpetuate itself. Uh, the best case scenario is we use as little of that grant fund as possible. And most of it is actually happening from the community, their work, their energy that they're putting in, having that grow. Uh, so that's a $100 million grant fund. We talk about it uh, on a weekly basis. We communicate on a weekly basis. We announce once a quarter. What are the questions do you guys have uh, about the grant program? How else can I flesh it out for you? I, I guess, how do people get involved? I mean, where where do they go? I can obviously drop links down down below in the the, the body of the, the description and stuff, but um, it, it'd probably be good to kind of get an idea. Where where do people go to, to apply? Uh, is there anybody lined up that perhaps they could speak to to find more before putting an application in? And, and stuff like that, obviously being really selective. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you know people are probably going to want to to know the best way to navigate that because we've got sure. we've got a, a very sizable community that um, uh, are made up of you know your, your, your newbies that are just entering into the space for the first time, people that have been here right from the beginning, and developers, project owners, and and, and all sorts. So yeah, it'd be good to kind of get an idea of of that as well. So a couple of two main places that you can interact with this is of course on Twitter. And then, of course, is the Discord. Uh, so you can go to the, the homepage and find the links to the Discord because I know we have to renew those on a regular basis. And in the Discord, we have uh, great community mods um, that'll help direct you to the right channel, that'll help answer, like direct you to any sort of FAQs that already exist. Fendora.org slash grants is also a page that you can find some FAQs. Um, and so that'll be incredibly helpful. Um, as far as other things that would help your community decide whether or not they want to get a grant. I want to reiterate what um, Discrete Labs is really focused on this year for the Fendora ecosystem, which is traction, which we're measuring with unique active wallets, the number of dApps, the number of assets, so the equivalent of your ERC-20s and other things like that, um, the number of transactions, the number of open source developers making commits and pull requests on GitHub, and then the size of our community. So you're looking at, you know, the Twitter followers, Reddit followers, all that sort of stuff. Um, those are our main metrics. So if you can show hard evidence 
that your project will dramatically improve those metrics, you will have a very favorable review from the committee, the, the grant staff. Um, that's what we're focused on. That's what we think we really need this year as far as a hard number, hard data uh, experience for Fendora. Super. Well, um, thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule to to spend the time with us and, and talk about everything Findora. I'm sure our community is going to be over the moon with the interview <laughs> and uh, you, you're taking the time out of your day for sure. Um, I'm I'm sure there'll be lots of questions and lots of people jumping into your Discord. I'll drop the link in the uh, description Perfect. of the video. Yeah, definitely. Obviously, it was really great having you on here and getting to talk to you. Learn more about Findora, expect privacy, the grant program. You know, there's so much going on there the proof of privacy podcast too you know lots of stuff going on here so yeah thank you for spending the time with us today thank you and again i want to encourage uh everyone who's listening to this podcast and watching this on the youtube to hit the like and subscribe uh and comment to make sure no uh, that's your guys's job that's not my job chris will throw that in in the 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 opening or the, the closing <laughs> of the podcast I definitely but you guys will. i definitely appreciate i really really appreciate you guys having me on uh, this is one of the things that I really enjoy about my job is the opportunity to talk about what it is we're doing here. And the fact that you guys get from the very, very bottom of the positive sum environment that we're trying to create, the fact that we're collaborative, not competitive, the, you know, the idea that we're really trying to use this technology to improve the world. This isn't just a get rich quip scheme. It's nice to be able to make some money, but it's really about the fact that this technology can improve a lot of things about our day-to-day -day lives. That's exciting. That's that's why I'm in the industry. So I want to thank you guys and your community for your approach to blockchain and Web3. I'm bringing it back. <laughs> We're going to call it Web... No, I'm kidding. What, what, what is it called these days? Uh, like AI, Metaverse, Web? <laughs> what's it called? What, what, what's the narrative now? I think it's called the information superhighway of tomorrow. That's yeah. that's what I'm convinced is we're still we're still calling it. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Sam. All right, you guys. Thank you so much. So I hope you enjoyed today's podcast with Sam from Findora. Fantastic. And really appreciate him taking the time out of his busy schedule to spend it with us, supporting the community and talking about everything Findora. If you enjoyed today's podcast, mash up that like button, subscribe if you haven't subscribed already, tapping that bell, selecting all the notifications so you never miss a podcast. Right, I will catch you in the next one. Take care.